Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending on uh, where you're joining from. Uh, and welcome to the second of the three part webinar series. Uh, my name is Samriti Rajal, and I am the training officer for the KBA Secretariat. In today's webinar, we will go over the online proposal portal section of the WD KBA and some of the main components of the online proposal. Um, a bit of housekeeping before we actually begin. Uh, this webinar session is being recorded. So if you want to turn off your video, uh, please feel free to do so. If you have questions, please ask them at the end of each section. Uh, or um, halfway through, we will be breaking for about five minutes as well. So you can ask your questions at that point as well. Um, when you do have a question, um, feel free to raise your hand uh, if you feel more comfortable that way, or if you want, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question directly as well. Um, or if you don't want, if your microphone doesn't work or you just don't want to speak, then you can post your uh, questions and comments in the chat box as well. But please be aware that I will not be able to see or read the messages immediately after you send it. Uh, but I will respond to them during break or during um, or at the end of the session. And finally, uh, once we're done with the introduction, so just before I start going into the proposal portal of the WDKBA um, in today's webinar, I will turn my video off so that you can see the entire screen uh, throughout the webinar and when the recording is actually made available that everyone can actually see the entire screen. Uh, at the end of the webinar, I will post a link to the feedback form as well, uh, so that we can, um, so with your feedback, we can improve the quality of these sessions. So just as a brief reminder, this is the second part of the three-part webinar series that is basically designed to help you learn how to use the WDKBA to propose um, and or reassess KBA sites. The target audience for uh, this or these uh, series are prospective proposers or NCG members who have completed the online or in-person training and have started compiling data, but are unsure about how to actually interact with the online proposal portal. Uh, so the purpose of this webinar is to actually help you understand how the proposal portal is set up and what sort of information you will have to provide when proposing a site. So our overall, overall learning goal today is to learn about the online proposal portal and become familiar with it. So specifically by the end of the session, you should be able to summarize uh, what information is expected in each page of the online uh, proposal, summarize how to write uh, a description for a required justification, outline the different types of evidence that can be used and how to cite it, and then finally also um, draft or write a description for a required justification. In the next slide, I will share the link to uh, the training site with you. As I mentioned in webinar one, you can use the training site to learn how to fill in the information and try to propose sites for different criteria and see how it works. Basically just interact with the, um, with the website. Nothing that you do in the training site will be carried over to the WDKBA. So this is the URL to the training site. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this site is used for training purposes only. Uh, so for this workshop, feel free to go over um, or to go to this link and create an account for yourself right now. And then you can use this account to test how to fill in the information. So during today's session, you can either choose to watch my shared screen and just listen to the rest of the webinar, or 
you can choose to split your screen and actively be interacting with the proposal portal as I go through each page. Please note that I will only be going over the tricky mandatory fields. I will not be going through each and every field in the proposal uh, because honestly, that would just take too much time. Uh, today's session is going to be relatively interactive, uh, so please feel free to ask questions uh, as it comes up. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you can unmute yourself to ask the question. Uh, if you do choose to send your question through chat, then I will respond to it, uh, but it'll be during break in the middle of the webinar um, or at the end of the webinar. The one thing that I would like to request is that you try to limit the question to the material that has already been covered in uh, so far. So by that, what I mean is if we are on page one and you have a question about page five, please wait until we're all at the end of page five before asking the question, because I might already be covering that material anyway. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, this session is being recorded and uh, will be uploaded in our YouTube channel and we will email you um, the link to the video once it has been uploaded. So now I'm gonna turn my video off as well, uh, just to make sure that everyone can see the entire screen uh, when I'm actually presenting the material. Okay. So when you first log in, this is the screen that you will see. On the left side of the screen, you can see the hamburger menu and five other icons. For today's session, we will only be going over the world icon, which is the site management section of the WDKBA. Now moving on to the other end of the screen on the right side, you can see your name and your role within the KBA. In my case, or in this case, I am uh, registered as an individual proposer. So left of that, there is the bell notification icon, or sorry, there is the bell icon, which is also the notification button. When there is a green dot on the bell, this basically means that you have notifications. And the number above the dot tells you how many notifications you have. So in this case, uh, for example, I have 20 notifications that I have not checked yet. And then next to that is the blue button that is labeled plus add new site. As the name suggests, if you are proposing a new site, you will need to click on this button to start the process. And towards the end of um, and towards the end of the uh, webinar today, I will show you how to reassess an existing KBA. I'm leaving it towards the end because the information that you will need to provide is the same for both uh, proposing a new KBA and for reassessing a site, but a new KBA proposal will have to start from scratch. So in the next five slides, I'll provide an overview of what type of information you will need to provide in the proposal. And then I'll go over the details uh, for some of these sections. So once you click on the blue plus add new site button, you will be taken to the KBA assessment section. In this assessment section, you can see the status of the proposal. So currently, you have just started drafting the proposal. So the proposal status is set to draft. The five tabs that you see in the middle of the screen here are the five sections of the proposal where you will be able to um, uh, put in information about the site and how and why it meets the KBA status. In site details, you will need to provide information related to the site. If you have been using the Excel form, then the details in this site details or site, uh, yeah, site details tab would come from Excel sheet two, site data, and Excel sheet five, 
habitat types. In the About page, you will need to provide some information about the proposal, specifically the criteria that you will be applying at the site and the consultations that have taken place with experts and the local knowledge holders. In the Assessment tab, you will need to provide data for the key biological elements at the site. This data will be used to assess whether the biological element triggers any KBA uh, criteria or not. So the information from Excel Sheet 3, Biodiversity Elements Data, is included in this assessment tab. In the Threats and Actions page, you will need to mention some of the threats and the conservation actions that are ongoing or conservation actions that are needed at the site. The data in this section will come from Excel Sheets for Conservation Actions and uh, 6 Threats Data. And based on the details you submit in the assessment tab, this criteria met tab of the proposal will automatically calculate or identify which KBA criteria are met by which species if it meets the minimum reproductive units uh, and the percent population or extent at site thresholds. Finally, at the um, right end of the screen, there is the invite button that lets you invite other people to co-propose the site with you. However, in order to make sure that they can co-propose the site with you, please make sure that they have registered in the WDKBA. So first, they need to register to the WDKBA, and then you can invite them to co-propose the site with you. So that's it for the overview of the information about the five tabs. Now let's, let's go into each of these in a bit more detail. And we will start with the site details tab. So the site details tab has basically 10 sections within it. The bolded sections site description, rationale, KBA identification, manageability, and delineation will appear in the site fact sheet. Everyone can view and download this fact sheet. So the information that you write in these four fields should be targeted at the general public. This means you should use simple language and provide all relevant data within these sections without making references to other sites that you may be proposing at the same time. In the next eight slides, I will go over the type of information we require in these sections and provide one example to highlight um, why it's a good example. After that, I will briefly also go over the mandatory portions of the protected or conserved area section, as well as the habitat and land use section. So first off, uh, site description. This field basically provides an overview of what the site is like. So how would you describe the site to someone who has never been there? We recommend that you provide the following types of information. General location. So the location of the site doesn't need to be very specific within the site description, but providing a rough location can help the reader orient themselves. For example, if there is a site in um, Canada, then if you just say that the site is in Canada, well, Canada is a very large country. So depending on where it is located, the um, expectations of the ecology and the climate of the region could be very different. So rather than just saying that this is a this site is in Canada, you could say this site is located in the northeast of the Yukon province because that provides a more um, 
accurate description of where uh, the site may be. We also recommend providing a general description of the site. So here you would just describe some key features of the site. And then next up is the biome or uh, mentioning some biological and or non-biological components of the site. As the sli slide shows, this is where you could mention some key vegetation, um, some uh, animal species, you could mention the topography um, or the elevation range uh, and so on and so forth. We are not suggesting that you find and tell us all of these details, but rather we're asking that you provide us with enough information to get a feel for the place. For example, if the site is on a hill, then elevation range could be, um, could be very important. But if the site is on the flatlands, then elevation range may not be um, that important uh, an information to provide. And then related to that, um, you could also mention some general climactic or weather patterns um, at the site. So this could be in terms of the annual precipitation, um, how windy the area is, is it mostly hot and dry or hot and humid, and so on and so forth. Finally, you could also mention some general human pressures or activities at the site if it is relevant. And these would just be general threats um, that the site faces, not specific threats uh, uh, that the species or the site faces. So here is a good example of the site. The first two sentences provides the reader with a rough idea of where the site is located. So here they've mentioned that this uh, Inago Mountain is in the western section of the Nampula province, which is in northern Mozambique. The next three sentences illustrate the general description of the site. So in this case, it's mostly uh, centered around the geology of the site. However, it does mention the elevation range of the mountain site as well, since it is such a large range. So the mountain, uh, uh, the elevation ranges from 300 uh, meters above sea level to 1,870 meters above sea level. And then, um, and then the sentence after that mentions the uh, weather or climate in form of annual precipitation at the site. And then finally, the last three sentences describe the biome of vegetation at the site. And here is where the elevation information comes in handy. Since they've already mentioned the elevation range, at this point, the proposer only needs to mention the biomes at specific relevant uh, elevations or elevation ranges. So basically, in this example, the proposer has succinctly described the site by mentioning the site uh, location and area, providing a general description of the site, mentioning the key features of the weather and the biome of the area. So the second field that will appear in the fact sheet is the rationale KBA identification. In this field, you will need to provide a snapshot of why this site is important. So basically, you'll need to describe which trigger elements meet which KBA criteria at the site. If there are more than five trigger elements that trigger any one KBA criteria, then you can simply lump them together mention the number of species uh, that meet that uh, specific criteria, and then just provide a couple of examples. So for example, in the last bullet point, um, there are 15 reptiles that meet criterion B2, including the iconic, uh, and then the you can provide the scientific name of the genus species one, and then uh, follow that up with the common name, and genus species two, and then common name. So rather than providing a full list of the 15 reptile species that meet the criteria on B2, you've mentioned that 15 reptiles meet this criteria 
and then just provide two to three examples. And again, here is a good example. So the first sentence in this example already hints at the KBA criteria that are triggered uh, at this site. Because it is geographically restricted, it hints at B1 and or B2. And then uh, because this site also hosts threatened species, it also hints at um, KBA criteria A1. And then finally, it also mentions the number of trigger elements, um, in this case, seven species. The rest of the description lays out the details of which species triggers which KBA criterion. So in summary, it's basically one reptile species triggers two A1 criteria, A1A and A1E. Two other reptiles trigger B1. The three of these uh, reptiles together trigger B2. And then there's one amphibian that triggers uh, the two A1 criteria again, A1A and A1E. And there are a further three insect species that trigger criterion B1. So this basically just provides you a snapshot of why this site um, has been confirmed as a KBA. The third field that will be visible to the public in the fact sheet is manageability. In this field, you basically need to answer the overarching question, who would be responsible for managing the site? Some questions that you may want to consider uh, when you are uh, drafting the justification for this uh, section could be along the lines of uh, how would decisions regarding management of the KBA be made? Who would actually have the authority to make decisions about the next steps and implement actions? Um, and if there are multiple actors involved in the process, then what is the understanding between them about this site and its KBA status? So for example, in this manageability text, the proposer has clearly identifies it identified uh, who manages the site. In this case, it is managed by traditional chiefs of the village and the organization ICCN. And they manage the site by actually forming a public-private partnership with a wildlife conservation society. So it's actually WCS that works with ICCN and the local community to manage the site. And then finally, we have the delineation uh, that will appear in the fact sheet as well. So in this field, you need to describe why you chose this particular boundary for this site. So this is an example. Uh, it is not based on a real site, but let's assume that there are four trigger species within uh, the site or within the area where the yellow lines represent the ecological boundary of the trigger species. The blue lines, um, the blue line that um, encompasses most of it is the KBA site boundary. At the top right corner, the boundary differentiates the forested land, which forms part of the KBA, from the agricultural land that is currently being used by local farmers. Below that, the boundary follows the, um, the road, even though there is some uh, area between the, the ecological boundary of this trigger species and the road, uh, it's included to follow the artificial topographical feature of the site. At the south of the border, the boundary follows the ridge, while the east and northeast boundary follows another road and another uh, side of the mountain ridge. So in the delineation field, we're looking for your rationale as to why you chose this particular boundary. In this case, it would basically be to differentiate the um, KBA site from agricultural uh, areas and uh, to follow the natural or artificial topological features. 
So here again is a good example of a delineation rationale. The first sentence lays out the consultations that took place, which shows local, invo local involvement and potentially, therefore, understanding of the area. After that, the proposer has mentioned the natural and topological and uh, artificial topological features that the boundary follows. The proposer has also delineated the boundary by taking into consideration future developments that could take place based on the consultations with local farmers. So they had in the south, it follows the boundary between, oh, sorry, not that. Um, so where the boundary follows agreed borders of the village, including areas of potential agricultural expansion. So this level of involvement could increase the local um, people's appreciation and support for the KBA designation as well. So that's it for the four fields that will appear in the fact sheet. Now we're moving on to um, the other two portions of the uh, site details that can be important as well. So in the protected or conserved areas section, you will first need to estimate how much of the KBA site is also a protected area or an OECM, other effective area-based conservation measures. If you have actual calculation, then you can add this to the percent calculated fields. However, if you are doing this, then um, you will need to calculate the percentage based on WDPA uh, data as the instructions show in the information. When you click on the information um, circle, you will see a bit more detailed guidance on how to do that. And then again, that was for protected areas, so you would have to do uh, exactly the same thing for an OECM as well. In the habitat description field, again, you will need to follow the IUCN habitat classification scheme and then indicate approximately what percentage of the site that habitat occupies. The IUCN habitat uh, classification scheme that is bolded in the information text here is clickable. So you can click on the bolded text here and the IUCN page on the habitat classification scheme will open up in a new tab or window, depending on what your default is. So that's basically it for the first half of the webinar. Okay, so, uh, before the break, we went over the four fields that will appear in the fact sheet, which are in the site details page of the proposal um, portal. The site details, uh, rationale, KBA identification, manageability, and delineation. Now let's go over the second tab about proposal. So in this page, uh, you will need to select which criteria you have applied to the site uh, or which criteria you were thinking about applying um, to the site, but for which you were not able to actually reach the threshold to trigger KBA criterion. Below the uh, proposal or about proposal section is the stakeholders and consultation section. In this section, you will need to provide information about the various consultations that have taken place with multiple stakeholders. For instance, you will need to describe the consultations that took place with biodiversity uh, knowledge holders about this site. When you are putting information in the um, biodiversity knowledge holders uh, field, please try to divide people into categories when you are inputting the information. So for instance, you could have a heading that says members of the scientific community and then list the names and contact details of relevant individuals. Then you could have a um, heading that says government officials and then list the names and contact details of uh, the government officials who helped you uh, or who provided um, biodiversity uh, related knowledge as well. 
And then finally, other biodiversity holders, and then list their names and contact details. It's just a way of making sure that uh, when someone is reviewing the information, so when the reviewer, when the RFP or the secretariat is reviewing the information, uh, they can they understand at a quick glance um, what who were the groups of people that you communicated to about this site. In the previous proposer's field, you will need to detail your consultations with the previous proposer if and when you're modifying site details and or the boundary of the site. If you are not proposing any significant changes and you don't need to consult with the previous proposer, then simply state that for the record, that you're not consulting previous proposers because it's not relevant or because you're not proposing any significant changes. In the government field, you will need to describe your consultations with uh, local and or national governments. So the consultations that you mentioned here could range from an information dissemination workshop about KBAs and the different sites uh, that were identified, um, or a consultation that is specific to the um, site, the KBA site that is being proposed. In the customary or legal rights holders section or field, you will need to detail any consultations you may have had with the customary or legal rights holders of the area. The contributors field is also going to be accessible to the general public as part of the fact sheet. As such, please only list out the names and institutions, if relevant, of the individuals consulted. Before doing that, please make sure that the individuals are aware that their names will be viewable by the public. And uh, please do not add any of their actual contact details in this section. The contact details should be included in the fields that are above this one. Uh, so this one should only have their names uh, and institutions uh, when it's relevant. But make sure that you get their consent to um, do that because the information on this field will be accessible to everyone. And then finally, the reviewers field is optional. And here you can also list out the names and contact information of potential independent reviewers who can provide input to validate the proposal. So now uh, we're moving on to the assessment tab. In the assessment tab, you will need to input data related to all the KBA criteria. So in this page, you will find sections where you can input species-based and ecosystem-based data, including criteria related to ecological integrity and irreplaceability. However, for today, we'll only be focusing on species and ecosystem data, but not on ecological integrity um, and irreplaceability. Uh, the latter two, so in ecological integrity and irreplaceability, will have their own targeted webinars later on. So let's get started with the species assessment data. Uh, the first thing that you need to do is add the species to the list. And you can do that by typing the scientific name of the species in the box. If there are a lot of options, then you may not see any of the options, or you will only see six uh, options in alphabetical order. For example, when you type in MECI, you may see no options written underneath because there may be more than six options. So continue typing and add the rest of the genus name. So now you can see that there are three possible options listed underneath. At this stage, you can either choose to complete the name of the species manually by typing it in, or you can uh, select the relevant option. And this field 
is linked to the IUCN Species Information System, SIS. So it will include species whose taxonomy has been accepted by the IUCN authorities, even if the species has not yet been assessed in the IUCN Red List. So once you select the relevant option and click on Add Species, the uh, Species Assessment page pops up. In, the, in this first view of the Species Assessment page, you can see some fields that may be useful in determining which KBA criteria you can try to apply. So for example, under the common name of this crocodile, there is the IUCN Red List category field. Information in this field can help you determine which KBA criteria threshold table to use. For example, can you apply um, criteria or criteria on A1 uh, and or B1? Or if it's not threatened, then uh, you would not be able to apply A1. The IUCN Red List criteria field has information that can help you determine which sub-criteria within A1 may be triggered by the species. So for example, in this case, the crocodile is critically endangered. And the red list criteria for the species is A2, A3, and A4. So you can or you could apply KBA criteria A1A and A1C for this species, depending on whether um, the, the species is able to meet the required thresholds at the site. The range restricted field can help you determine whether the species would be eligible to apply KBA criteria B2. And finally, the uh, ecoregion uh, bioregion restricted field can help you decide whether the species could be eligible to apply KBA criteria B3. And once you've cross checked the information or the species information, uh, you can select the assessment parameter that you want to use for the species. So in this case, um, mature individuals. Then if the IUCN red list has information on that assessment parameter, the information will be automatically pulled in from their website. If the IUCN red list does not have data on the selected assessment parameter, you will need to manually fill in the information. Uh, additionally, if you have more recent and more accurate data, then you can change the information in any or all of these four fields. However, if you do change any of the information in these uh, four fields, then you will need to write a justification in the additional details section. So in the additional details field, you will have to justify using a different data source. So here is an example of how to write a justification in the additional details field when there is data discrepancy in the global uh, data section. Uh, so uh, I'm just gonna read that out loud uh, so it's easier to explain. Uh, the global population, so this is the actual justification for the difference in um, the between the information that you're providing and the IUCN um, red list data. The global population of mature individuals of the unicorn butterfly is more than three times higher than what is reported on the red list. Additionally, this site contains 15% of the global mature uh, population. And then there's the citation for that statement. Uh, and we developed the estimate with the help of expert name and the data and results are available here. So within this sentence, you're referring to the expert who, wh whose help you used to uh, update the information. And then their, the information that they provide is also linked so that the uh, regional focal point can review it 
um, in the process. And then finally, uh, you can say that the global population from the red list needs to be updated. Uh, here, you can also mention what steps you've taken to update uh, the um, global population uh, number or number of mature individuals uh, in the red list as well. But let's backtrack a little bit. So what does mature individuals actually mean? The KBS Secretariat uses IUCN's definition of mature individuals. And I'm sure that you know this already, but mature individuals, but just to make sure that all of us are in the same uh, page, uh, mature individuals refers to the number of individuals that are known, estimated, or inferred to be capable of reproduction. Population size refers to the number of individual organisms in the population, regardless of whether they are capable of reproduction or not. So with that in mind, I just want to sort of confirm that in this particular picture of bighorn sheep, where there are three individuals, the population size for this picture is three, but the number of mature individuals is one, because there is um, one uh, individual a female who is capable of reproduction, but the other two are lambs who are not uh, capable of reproduction yet. And then similarly, in this picture of orangutans, the population size would be two, but the number of mature individual is only one. And then the same thing here, the population size in this picture of whales is two, but then the um, mature individual is just one. So as I mentioned earlier, if the global data for the assessment parameters uh, that you select is available in the IUCN red list, the data will be pulled in automatically, but the site level data will always need to be filled in by you, the proposer. So the year min and year max refer to the range of dates of the data that you are providing for that particular assessment parameter. Your min should be the date of the earliest data that you are using. Ideally, this should be within the last 8 to 12 years or earlier than that, if possible, or closer to the date that you're proposing, if possible. So, for example, if you're proposing a site this year in 2023, then the year min should be 2011 or later, later as in closer to 2023. Um, and so obviously your max is just the date of the most recent data. So again, for a site that you're proposing this year in 2023, the uh, most recent data that you might have available could be at most 2023. The next three fields, uh, min site, best site, and max site, refers to the range of data that is available, uh, which is min and max site, and then the average uh, or the best site estimate. If there is only one population or extent estimate for the site, then you will need to input that number in the best site field and just ignore the min site and max site fields. And then finally, you also have to cite the source that you got the information from. And when you are uh, writing out the source in this uh, field, please make sure that you provide the link to the source if relevant uh, and or the name and contact details of the expert whom you may have consulted. In the derivation of estimate, you will need to um, click on the drop down menu. Um, yeah, you'll need to click on the drop down menu and then select the one method that was used to get information that you wrote in the best field method. So, for example, there are a couple of options such as single survey, mean of multiple survey, and estimated from mapping. So, based on how you got the information that you put in, uh, best site, 
you will have to select the most appropriate um uh you'll have to select the uh, the best appropriate option uh based on how you got that number um and then obviously the year of estimate is simply referring to the year that the estimate was made and then in the year of presence field you will need to describe how you know that the species is still found at the site so this could be uh, through consultations with experts, local residents, uh, direct observations, project survey, published research, and so on and so forth. And then next to that, you'll just need to write uh, what year the evidence is from. Again, ideally, the year presence field should be um, within, should fall within the last 12 years before the year that you're proposing the site. So again, for a site being proposed in 2023, your presence should be 2011 or more recent than that. So now we've come to the reproductive units portion of the presentation. And this is a section that causes everyone a lot of grief. So we're actually just going to go and start from the beginning. Some of the species-based criteria have reproductive units as one of the thresholds. So what do we mean by reproductive units? The official KBA definition of one reproductive unit is the minimum number and combination of mature individuals necessary to trigger a successful reproductive event at a site. So here, I would like to stress that the individuals have to be mature, because if the individuals are not mature, then they would not necessarily be capable of reproduction. Uh, so for a sexually reproducing species, in essence, you could think of the, you could rephrase the um, definition to be how many mature males and females would be required to have a successful reproductive event. So to figure out the reproductive units, you would need to know the ecology of the species. Specifically, what is the mating strategy of the species? So for example, lions have a harem where one or two males can mate with all the mature emails, uh, or sorry, all the mature females in the pride. So uh, in the case of lions, 10 reproductive units would require 10 mature females, but only one mature male, because that one male can meet mate with all the 10 mature females in the pride to trigger 10 successful reproductive events. Okay. Okay, so with that, uh, basic understanding of reproductive units, um, we're going to go back to the proposal portal. So in the field labeled minimum number of reproductive units, you need to tell us or confirm the minimum number of reproductive units that are present at the field, at the site, sorry. So basically think about how many um, mature individuals uh, were observed of each sex and then based on their mating strategy, how many reproductive units they would form or they could form. In the field labeled define reproductive units for this species, you would need to uh, think about the mating strategy of the species, think about what one reproductive unit looks like, and then extrapolate that to what 10 reproductive units could be for the species. This field has absolutely nothing to do with site level data, and it is here only to confirm uh, that, like, only to confirm your understanding of the interaction between the ecology of the species and the definition of reproductive units. Also, another thing to consider or to keep in mind is that this field, defined reproductive units for uh, this species, should always have information about what constitutes 10 reproductive units for the species. And then uh, finally, we have the uh, source of reproductive units data field. 
in this field, you basically need to write down how you confirm the number that you wrote in the minimum number of reproductive units field. In general, direct or indirect observations are ideal, but in some cases you can infer reproductive units data as well. Um, however, if you are inferring reproductive units data, then please refer to the KBA guidelines, specifically section 9.2, for more details on the limitations and on um, how to do it for what type of species. So after inputting the reproductive units data, you will come across the nature of occurrence field. In this field, you will have to select which criterion or criteria you want to apply for this species. Please make sure that you click the apply button that is at the bottom of the uh, nature of selection uh, drop down menu because if because otherwise the selection that you made will not be incorporated in the calculations. The justification field is mostly uh, as mentioned on the slide for aggregatory uh, and or range restricted species. So uh, use this field basically to mention whether the species is aggregatory and or range restricted. If the species is not either of those, then just mention that the species is not aggregatory or range restricted. And then finally, in the source button or in the source field, you will need to provide the citation information. So provide links to documents or reputable websites. Um, you can also obviously provide names and contact information of the experts or local knowledge holders whom you may have consulted uh, for information on this section. So with that, we've actually completed the species assessment um, section, and now we're on to the ecosystem data section of the assessment page. So to apply the ecosystem-based criteria, uh, specifically for threatened species, you will need to refer to the red list of ecosystems. The key information that you will need to refer to from this site is the name of the ecosystem, the risk category of the ecosystem, and the name of the assessors and the citation information so that you can cite it in the proposal. So in the ecosystem uh, database within our proposal portal, uh, you will need to refer to the Red List of Ecosystem website to just type in the name of the ecosystem in this field, ecosystem name. And as you type in the name of the ecosystem uh, here in ecosystem name, the name gets automatically updated under new triggers. Once you've typed the full name of the ecosystem, you can use the information from the Red List of Ecosystems website to input the relevant information on this page. So for example, in terms of the global extent of <coughs> ecosystem type, uh, you can again refer to the Red List website and then um, where the area of occupancy of the uh, ecosystem is mentioned and then calculate the global extent in kilometer square. And then you will need to provide some key site level information, uh, such as the range of the area of the ecosystem type at the site and the best estimate. Uh, you'll also need to provide the year of the ecosystem data and cite the sources that you used. So you can cite the mapping tools that you used, experts that you may have consulted, uh, and articles that you may have referred to. And then simply click on the blue button at the bottom that is labeled finish editing. And basically that's it for ecosystem data. And then in the uh, threats and actions tab, you can select the relevant ongoing conservation actions at the site uh, and or conservation actions that you think are needed at the site. For either of the options, uh, you will first need to uh, select yes or no from the drop-down menus. 
And uh, if you select yes, then a further drop down menu comes up under sub criteria. And then under this uh, drop down menu, the under the sub criteria, you can select multiple options uh, based on whichever one is uh, whatever options are relevant for the site. Finally, you can also select the threats that are prominent uh, at the site. Level one threats are broad uh, threats for the uh, site, for example, agriculture and aquaculture. And then level two threats are a bit more narrow. So within level one threats, what is the main threat? So here you may have options uh, within level two, um, such as livestock farming and ranching, uh, wood and pulp plantation, and so on and so forth. So let's say that you select um, uh, wood and pulp plantation for your level two threat. Then you'll have to select level three threat from further options. And this level three threat is more in terms of the scope of the threat. So you would have options such as smallholder plantations, agro-industry plantations, um, or scale unknown unrecorded. Out of these options, uh, select the best available uh, selection. And then uh, you'll also need to add the timing of the threat. So was it a threat in the past? Is it a current threat? Or is it mostly just a future threat? And again, that's it for the threats and actions tab as well. In the criteria met tab, you basically just see the results of the calculations based on the information that you provided in the assessment tab. So when you input information in the assessment tab, the site and global information are used to calculate which uh, KBA criteria are triggered by which species or ecosystem. And this is dependent on the selection of nature occurrence in the assessment tab. So if there is any discrepancy between what you are expecting to see in this field and what you actually see in this field, please check that all the mandatory fields in the assessment tab has been filled. Because if it hasn't, then it will not uh, do the calculations and you will not see anything here. And basically, that is it. We're through to the end of the proposal portal of the WDKBA. Um, now I'm just going to go over some of the basics of how to register in the WDKBA and then uh, straight after that how to reassess sites. So to register on the WDKBA, you can simply go to the KBA website www.keybiodiversityareas.org and then click on the green button on the right side um, of the screen uh, that is labeled Login to WDKBA. When you click on the Login to WDKBA button, it will take you uh, directly to the WDKBA website. And once you're on this page, you will need to click on the blue button that is labeled Register. When you click on the register button, you will be directed to this registration page where you will have to fill in the information about yourself. Uh, once you filled in all the mandatory fields, you can click on the blue create account button to create an account for yourself. And then in terms of reassessing an existing KBA, uh, you can, so we're going to go back to the first view of the site management uh, section of the WDKBA. Um, to narrow down the list of uh, sites, you can select the appropriate country, year, and status from the drop down menus, from the three drop down menus that appear above the site. And then uh, once you have um, a shortlist and you can see your site is in the shortlist, then you just need to click on the ellipses on the right end of the screen um, for the appropriate site, and then click on the Assess Biodiversity button. When you click on the Assess Biodiversity uh, button, it will take you to the proposal portal where you will have to fill out all the mandatory fields. 
As I mentioned at the start, when you are reassessing an existing site, the existing site data will be populated in the relevant fields. However, you will need to update the information in the fields and ensure that all mandatory fields are completed. So some fields are completely new in the, um, uh, so some fields are new and were added within the last few years. So the reassessments may not actually, uh, or so sites that you would be reassessing may not actually have data in those fields yet. Um, please select uh, the reassess or assess biodiversity button only if you are in the process of actually reassessing the site, uh, because once someone starts the reassessment, no one else can reassess the site. So you, like anyone else, would still be able to view the information, but they would no longer be able to um, reassess the site or start uh, reassessing the site until and unless you either delete the draft or you um, um, you complete the process and you actually um, submit the reassessment. So that's it for the webinar today. Um, uh, well, the general information. Uh, thank you for participating in this webinar. I hope that it was a good introduction to the WDKBA and will be useful when you start the process of proposing KBAs.